Hey guys, and welcome back. Today I'm driving a 2010 Audi A6. Being a 2010, this A6 is part of the C6 or 4F version of the Audi that ran from 2004 through to 2011. Now when this car was created, it was created when BMW held dominance with their E39 5 Series and Audi needed something to answer back. This is what they produced. It's quite a solid car, as we'll see. Let's go through some of it. Starting in 2004, the A6 was offered in varying trim levels as a saloon only, but was joined by an estate or wagon version that Audi likes to call the Avant from mid-2005. Audi are well known for a long options list and the spec of each individual car varies greatly. The 4F version of the C6 was offered with no less than 11 engine choices over its model run. You could have 4 cylinder, 6 cylinder, 8 cylinder. Get the S6, you could even have a 10 cylinder. You could have petrol, you could have diesel. Turbo, naturally aspirated, supercharged. There was something for everyone. Alongside that, you could have the choice of a CVT gearbox in the lower models. Personally, that'd be something I would probably avoid if I could. In some models, you could get a six-speed manual, although that's quite rare. And in others, you could get this ZF six-speed automatic transition. That's probably what you're gonna find in most of them in North America, uh, at least, and, and in Australia. Addy also offered their trademark Quattro four-wheel drive system, which is a bit of a point of difference because it's a bit of a different type of four-wheel drive system to what was offered on the uh, iX Drive BMWs uh, of the time. The Quattro name has heritage going back to the UR Quattro that everybody loves from the 80s. In 2008, the C6 received a facelift, which I think really brought it into a more contemporary era, especially at the time. Audi added the daytime running LED lights. They changed the way that the tail lights were designed, which I think really was an improvement because the old tail lights were quite dated by that time. Uh, in fact, the current tail lights on this facelifted model were continued into the next version, uh, the C7 A6. The facelift also brought the introduction of Audi's 3.0T 3 litre supercharged engine. That's been confusingly named, I know. You'd think 3.0T, well that's a turbo, but no, it's a it's basically the 3.2 litre V6, which is a quite standard engine on this car. Displacement dropped a little bit, but the addition of an Eden supercharger, which boosts the power to well over 300 horsepower and boost the torque and I think this engine does represent the sweet spot in the range and this is an engine that I would probably choose over some of the turbo engines uh, that were in the era because the thing about the supercharger coupled with the relatively large displacement the three litres is it's the instant power the get up and go moving off from the traffic lights you don't have to worry about waiting for a turbo to spool up getting embarrassed by someone in their mild hatchback. The power's just straight there. Yes, it doesn't have the top end run. It doesn't come on boost because the boost is there from the start. But for most of us, we're not one to be thrashing the plate and thrashing the engine around, thrashing the car around all the time. Um, we just want a car that can punch us around town, that's got enough energy to overtake nicely when we need to. In terms of fuel economy, as I pull up to this bridge and I get the feeling that the uh, fellas aren't going to let me go across it, uh, maybe they would have. In terms of fuel economy, on the motorway you should get about 8 litres per 100, which is pretty good for the kind of car that this is. But around town, if you're uh, enjoying yourself in the traffic lights, 
that figure's going to climb. And 16 litres per 100 is probably not out of the ballpark if you don't really have to drive very far every day. It really depends on your circumstance, but keep in mind that it's not exactly a sipper of fuel. That being said, the opportunity for economy over the V8 or the V10 is definitely there. And the diesel, well, the six-cylinder diesel, uh, the six-cylinder diesel is probably going to be more fuel efficient, but that engine has a few reliability issues to do with the timing chains. So something you need to keep in mind when you're making your purchase. Now this car does handle well through these bends, it stays flat. These Pirelli tyres give good grip. You've got the Quattro all-wheel drive on this particular model. It does inspire confidence and of course you've got the engine. Get up and go. Brakes are very good on Volkswagen Audi products it seems. Flappy paddle gearbox as well, just to make it a bit more fun. Now let's have a chat about the interior. Audi seats have a bit of a reputation amongst the larger folk out there for being a little hard on the back, and I did find initially that a longer drive would leave me with lower back pain I didn't experience in other cars. After a bit of trial and error though, adjusting the seat to be in a more upright position, I found this to be improved. Now it is true that we do look at a bit of a button fest when we look at the controls and that's something that's a product of its time. 2000 and sort of early 2000s design, nothing like the sleek touch screens of today. But the point is, once you learn what each button does, it's a very quick way of getting things done. The navigation is certainly not contemporary, but it is functional and you can still buy updated maps if you need to. Dual zone climate control comes on this model and as you can see it's repeated on the screen which is quite nice. There are a lot of menus that you can scroll through to see various pieces of information. The car also comes with electronic steering wheel adjustment, which I always think adds a touch of class. Another thing I do like is this scroll wheel system they have on the steering wheel. You can very quickly turn up and down your stereo and very quickly scroll through your contacts on your phone. We've got folding mirrors, although like many car manufacturers they miss the trick that what you really want is mirrors that automatically fold when you lock the car. They don't do that, but you can at least do it manually. In the way of cup holders up front, well you've got one that's immediately accessible behind this cover here, but the second one is beneath the centre console armrest, which I don't know, it's just not great. You've also got a bin in here in which you can hide Mentos to discover years after you put it there. And then you've got the glove box. In their infinite wisdom, Audi has decided that the best way to open the glove box is not with a traditional handle, but with an electronic release. Seems all well and good, but what happens when that electronic release breaks? Another thing that can be a little bit frustrating is this, with the keyless go, to turn off the car, well, you just press that and it goes off, but that's not the end of the story. If you want to lock the steering wheel and properly shut everything down, you need to hold the stop button for another second or two afterwards, which, I don't know, it just seems harder than it should be. Another problem that this car seems to suffer from, and because it's happening to both of them, I guess it must uh, be an ongoing problem, is that the back of the seats, the back of the front seats likes to become delaminated and fall away. 
not only that, there's no seat pockets in the back of them either. So the rear seat passengers have to contend with what's offered in this bin and rather small door pockets. Nothing really in the way of cup holders back here. The other issue for the parents out there is while the car does have the top tether points behind these covers, there's no isofix points in the base of the seats. Well, I believe it was an option anyway, it's not standard. So, if you have a modern child seat, you have to make do with the old seatbelt pass-through method. Another way it sort of shows its age. Now, one other slightly annoying thing with this car in terms of reliability, you can hear that it's developed a bit of a rattle. Which is hard to trace. It's around this area of the dash, but... Oh comes and goes. Not something that is all that pleasant, sort of just like a mosquito. Now prices for these cars vary greatly. You heard me say there was 11 engine choices. There's the base A6, there's the S6, RS6. In Australia at least, the price gap is tremendous. You can get yourself into an early C6. It's going to have probably a 2.4 litre naturally aspirated engine. Mercedes. To get these sorts of outputs, you're going to be paying well north of $20,000. You can find one that has full service history from an Audi dealer or a specialist. You should set yourself up for relatively trouble-free motoring. I know that Volkswagen and Audi products do have a bit of a reputation, but I think that reputation is somewhat misfounded by people that buy them and expect that they should have to spend nothing on it, especially on the Volkswagen side. They think, oh, it's just a regular car. I can just, you know, service this every three years. It'll be right. No, you need to keep on top of the servicing. Keep that oil changed. Use good quality oil. Use premium fuel when you can. Consider servicing the gearbox. Keep on top of the suspension components as they come up. And it should be relatively trouble-free to own. Now driving this car as well, you are partaking in a bit of a dying breed because the big saloon car, it's not nearly as popular as it once was with everyone wanting to transition to, first of all it was SUVs and now, particularly in Australia and in the US, people want to drive the pickup or the, the ute, the, the Hilux, the Ranger, the F-150, that sort of thing. But I think there's still quite a lot to be said for this kind of car. It's aerodynamic, it looks sleek, it's comfortable, it's quiet, they ride well. And you get a much more refined product for your money. Now there are some ergonomic quirks associated with age as we've seen, but I feel these can be overcome and the car does represent good buying at this point in time. Now a lot of people like to stereotype car owners we know about the same in Volvo drivers, you know what they say about Kia, Honda drivers, BMW drivers. Now the Audi driver doesn't get a great reputation, they're thought of as being a patient kind of person that's going to duck and weave around you, always want to blow you off at the traffic lights. Someone who's a stubborn kind of person, someone who doesn't really have much time for people they think they look down on. But, I mean, the reality is, people of all sorts buy all sorts of cars. I 
don't think you need to be swayed by that reputation. You just need to look for a product that suits the needs that you have. And if you want to drive around in something that's comfortable, relatively quiet, and stylish, you can't go too wrong with this 4FC6.